Today, I will be presenting to you three topics. The halting problem being unsolvable, and then other problems such as uh, checking certain Turing machines to have interesting properties uh, cannot be solved by an algorithm. And then uh, we'll be talking briefly about the theory of NP completeness. Uh, they are all very related. The way you understand the halting problem and the way you understand NP completeness are extremely similar. I have to review some definitions and then uh, we will uh, launch into the main theorem. Most of the proofs are going to be English descriptions, pseudocode. So the idea of recursively enumerable sets and recursive sets are important to explain halting, the halting problem. A recursively enumerable language is the language of a Turing machine. That's all uh, it says. A machine that has a language, if it halts on a certain input, it is a member of that uh, Turing machine's language and look at all the strings such as that. Um, anything that uh, makes the machine loop is not in this language. Anything that, ma that makes the machine reject is not in its language. A uh, recursive language is a language of a Turing machine that halts on all inputs. So you will keep uh, running different inputs. You get an accept or a reject decision in each case. The first is indicative of a general procedure and the second is indicative of an algorithm. And then we have this uh, idea that uh, if a language and its complement are recursively enumerable, then uh, the language is also recursive. And the general idea is that you have a language L that is recursively enumerable. So at least there is some theorem, Turing machine for uh, L, call it TML. And what is, what is its property? Its property is that given any, any input, if X is a member of L, uh, then this machine will halt. I'll put TML here. This is an actual machine. And now we have another machine called TM L bar because we also said L is uh, uh, complement of L is also recursive, uh, is recursively enumerable. So the complement of L is also recursively enumerable. So that means it has also a machine. And its property is that if you give a, a, a y in L bar, uh, this guy is going to halt. Uh, I'll call it x in L bar. So any x comes from L or L bar. So one of the machines has to halt on that x. So by using two programs or two Turing machines or two procedures, we can realize an algorithm. That's what we are saying. We have two procedures. Now we can make an algorithm. How? Um, ask the user for an input and feed it to this procedure, which may loop if uh, x is not in L. But this guy will halt. This guy may loop is if x is in uh, is not in L bar. But then this guy will halt. So one of them will halt. So we can use two half checkers to get a full checker. And then uh, the accept decisions uh, can be suitably combined. So if this guy says accept, it is a global accept for the full box we are building. And if this guy says accept in the sense of the true language, it is the reject decision for the true language, the L language. So these are the kind of constructions that allows us to study procedures and algorithms with respect to the properties they have. Most of the proofs in this uh, chapter are uh, constructions of uh, using procedures to build other procedures. So let us look at examples of these enumerable languages. And uh, there are two definitions uh, one can go by. So the previous definition of recursively enumerable was that 
There is a Turing machine associated with that language. But another uh, convenient definition and equivalent definition is that there is a, a Turing machine that simply spews out the contents of the language. It doesn't need any input. It is an output only Turing machine. And the property of such a machine, if it exists for a language, must be that for any string in that language, <coughs> that Turing machine must guarantee to emit x in a finite amount of time. It must not uh, bias against a certain member of the language and never output it. No, that's not the case. It has to slowly go through length order or whatever and eventually guarantee to output it. So if you can argue and build such a machine, then you can at that point point to that Turing machine and say, by virtue of there being an enumerator, enumerator for this language, it now is a recursively enumerable. That's how the word even originated. And the way we argue that is, we find, let's say, multi-tape Turing machines are a convenient device. Let's use that. Uh, in this class, we are not showing that multi-tape Turing machines are equivalent to single tapes. We can fold all the tapes and sort of interleave blocks, saying this is block for tape one, this is a block for tape two, this is a block for tape three. You can sort of uh, interleave the contents of different tapes into one tape. Those things are easy and believable. So we are not getting into that uh, foray. And then uh, you can have an output only tape, etc. So let's see how these are accomplished. So let's take an actual language and achieve both constructions for uh, understanding the definition of recursively enumerable. And as a candidate language, I'm taking something associated with context-free grammars as uh, being recursively enumerable. The language of a context-free grammar is easily recursively enumerable. That's not what I'm talking about, but you can think of it that also, okay? Language of a, of a context-free grammar. It is not only recursively enumerable, it's recursive, because if you challenge that context-free grammar with a string, the parser for that context-free grammar will wake up and say, yes, no, I'm in this language or not. So that's a very wimpy question. We don't even bother to ask that. So now we are asking a deeper question, saying, suppose you are given two context-free grammars and paired up in this fashion. Can we construct a language out of it? L, G1, not equal to G2. So again, these are grammars uh, represented in some standard format, like the Joe format or whatever. But the property of a pair sitting in this language must be that these two grammars um, must have different languages. So the enumeration argument is what uh, I will uh, show you. How do you show that this is recursively enumerable? So at that point, the enumerator view will ask you to produce a Turing machine that uh, takes no inputs at all and has an output tape. And on that, it keeps printing uh, G1, G2, G1 prime, G2 prime, that is its job. The Turing machine should keep producing pairs, such that if any grammar pair has different languages, it must appear in finite time. Okay, so how does that Turing machine get constructed? Uh, enumeration arguments are very simplistic. That's the M enum, which pr keeps printing. So this is the M enum enumerator <coughs> machine. <coughs> In its internal tape, it has internal tapes also. It keeps generating pairs of frame sigma star according to numeric order, according to some length order. So it may generate all pairs of strings of certain length, and then it uh, goes to all pairs of strings of a length up to a length n plus one. All these are finitary processes. And each time it generates a pair of strings, it appeals to a checker saying, is this even conforming to the standards of a context-free grammar, or is it a broken context-free grammar syntax? If the checker says it is fine, then it knows that that is now a context-free grammar pair. So what does it then do? It has other tapes in inside it. It now starts generating strings, uh, or it in parallel is generating strings from sigma star. 
I will assume C is sigma 0, 1. And then uh, whenever uh, two grammars are generated and one string is generated, it uh, simply tries to parse that string with those two grammars. And if the grammars have a different decision on that string, now that uh, machine can emit G1, G2 on the tape. And if you say all that, uh, you have exhibited a machine that enumerates grammar pairs that have different languages. Uh, that's how that is RE. Are you kind of following the general sense of this topic? We are not very formal, but uh, clear enough that by now we know these programs can be written. The existence of these programs is all we care about at this point. How useful are these programs? Uh, that comes next. Generally, when you find some pro program with a nice property exists, then all the scientists will say, now how can we make it better? So that is a different story. It is all where existence first. And there's no other way to argue existence of an algorithm and ex non-existence of an algorithm. It's such a general topic. So you have to make the argument so pedantic and simple. So you'll get used to that. The other uh, argument, so suppose you want to actually exhibit a Turing machine that is kind of a witness for grammars such that the grammars have different languages, then it's not a enumerator view that you had to exhibit. Uh, you must have an actual Turing machine that uh, really takes two inputs, uh, uh, paired up inputs on its tape. Then how shall such a Turing machine be built to explain that G1, G2, such that G1, G2 have different languages is RE. So this is the machine acceptor view. Um, not too hard. Let this uh, Turing machine hide the M enum inside it. And uh, it doesn't show you that, but it has that enumeration going. So as soon as you come up with a grammar pair, it simply internally waits for G1, G2 to appear in that uh, enumeration. And then when that happens, uh, the steering machine says yes, accept, no. Uh, but uh, you know, sometimes, I don't know whether it can say whether two grammars are conclusively uh, I mean, this yes means the grammars are different. Okay, so let us uh, see what I just now stumbled into. So when it, it says yes, it is a language in equivalence, yes. Okay, it is saying grammars are different languages. And it has spotted one string that exhibits that. So this is a firm yes. I can vouch for you. But the no is a little iffy no. The no here means the grammars have the same language. And uh, how did it divine that? Magic, but sometimes it can stumble into it. It, it has a lucky uh, guesses also. One grammar that it enumerated might be S A, A goes to epsilon. Another might be S goes to S. Okay, those are both context-free grammars. I'm just making up a story, but uh, you get the idea. This, this is a context-free grammar on, in unto itself. This is a context free grammar in down to itself, and it's an empty language. So special cases do arise, and it gets lucky. And, and uh, but what is this now? This is a yes or a no. They have different languages. Different. Yeah, so it is still belongs to yes. I still haven't <laughs> generated that case. But by some luck, we might emit S goes to A, and A goes to epsilon A as one grammar. And another maybe S goes to epsilon as another grammar. And then uh, through some superficial syntactic matching and all that, it's, it concludes that the grammars have the same language. Then it belongs to the no compartment because it's, they're not different. <laughs> but that is not a perfect process because there are occasionally languages, uh, the grammars, whose uh, language content is infinitary. So there's no way to probe it out and say that they are the same. So that is the third possibility, the looping possibility that is hidden here. Okay, uh, we will look at uh, in, enough of these examples. So today's class is the first pass through these arguments showing you how the halting problem looks and all that. We'll have to revisit all this on Thursday. You'll have to see it three, four times to make it at all. So hopefully, 
so far was not confusing what was said. Yeah, so I, this is what I said. Now we have to look at another language, which is really the language we need to focus on for the halting problem or acceptance problem. So let us not study it as a halting problem challenge yet, but it has a simpler property associated with it. Let us look at that first. So there is this uh, convenient language called ATM, which is acceptance Turing machine language. The reason I'm teaching acceptance is because then I can give you halting as a homework because the proofs are very similar. So if you look at assignment six, I give you the entire argument for acceptance and I'll ask you to mirror that into halting. It's a very simple adjustment. The book has it and you will see the pseudocode and all that, okay? Acceptance test is halt like halting test. Acceptance test is a final test. It, it halts in the accept state. Halting means accept or reject. So acceptance testing machines are usually can more convenient Anyway, so what is ATM? This is the language of machine Turing machine input pairs uh, such that uh, M is a Turing machine. It encodes uh, the Turing machine in some good syntax. And W is a word uh, allowed on the tape of the Turing machine and X, uh, M accepts W. Yeah, so all your C programs and inputs such that those C programs uh, do something good for you for that input. And uh, we'll soon come to this uh, real problem. It's a challenge that it is not recursive, but let us uh, at least uh, reconcile with the fact that it is enumerable. You can at least enumerate such MW pairs. And we can also do the language acceptance uh, argument to show that it is an RE, recursively enumerable. Recursively enumerable really belongs to the enumeration argument, but once you have the enumeration argument at hand, uh, you can immediately build an acceptance machine with the enumerator hidden inside, like I showed you a minute ago. Because uh, once you got the enumerator that uh, perpetually printed on a tape, like here, getting the acceptance machine view is not hard because you can hide the enumerator inside and present an acceptor view. Anyway, so what do I say? Fill in this class. Okay, fill this in class. Let's fill it. Enumerator of M and W, uh, similar argument, uh, generate all M, W pairs, and then uh, run each M on each W for increasing quanta, for quanta of time. I, I write that pretty much for uh, more and more fuel increasing fuel. This is a, to avoid looping. You don't want to just blast M on W and then wait and then do the next step because you may never get to the next step. So for increasing, while that run is uh, finished for 10 uh, units of fuel, then you generate uh, the next machine W pair, run everything now for 10 and 11 and uh, then one more machine W pair. And whenever one machine is found to halt in the accept state, you print that MW pair when another machine uh, does that, you list it, etc. So it is enumerable. The thing is you can detect uh, the positive, positive outcome of a machine accepting an input. That positive outcome, whenever it happens, can be uh, evidenced by putting it on a, on a tape. That's all we are saying. In any case where this M on a W keeps cranking, keeps cranking, despite giving more and more fuel, you never get to put it on a tape. And truly, if that M is never going to accept W, it'll never appear on that tape. But after a billion years, if it appears that M accepts W, it'll appear there. That's still finite, finitely witnessed. And that's all we ask for. And the acceptor, Acceptor view, uh, machine acceptor view, uh, there are two, uh, two ways to actually present the machine acceptor view. The first is uh, you pretend that you are a box that accepts a machine and a W, and then internally use the enumerator. The enumerator keeps uh, producing all the MWs 
that accept uh, such that m accepts w and if your pair is found in that eventually then you will output it yeah all turing, turing machine one by one by one well, yeah yeah, so think of think of main program. This is a Turing machine for you. This is a Turing machine. That's all you need to think. Main. That's a C program. C programs and Turing machines are identical. Okay. So think of uh, having an argument x maybe. Okay. With some with the arg z and arg v. The next uh, Turing machine in this category for C programs is main x, curly brace, semicolon. That's a legal C program. It's a different C program, but it is, it works. You can uh, compile and run, it'll return, etc. So now you have to produce uh, all kinds of C programs, but not miss, no, no, don't go into this sequence. This is bad. If I keep putting three semicolons on four semicolons, you're getting newer and newer C programs according to the syntax, okay? Think of these as no-ops or uh, cleverly obfuscated, but you have to enumerate the space of all C programs systematically, and that's possible. You, what, what you do is have a C grammar and C parser with you, throw strings at it, <laughs> one by one from sigma star, from A to Z, curly brace, underscore star, keep throwing strings at it. Whenever that parser says, now this is a C program, and uh, you throw the strings in enumeration order, not in lexicography. So these strings are getting longer and longer up to a certain end. And then whenever that parser says, yes, I am a C program, up to length of five billion, you throw it out. So you can enumerate machines. Well, uh, that is an unknowable fact, which is what uh, we are going to prove later. The, the fact that a program run on an input, whether it ever reaches the accept or reject state, is unknowable by an algorithm. Yeah, that is why it is not a recursive set. But whenever it, uh, it uh, accepts or whenever it goes to its uh, halt state, we can discern that as a finite piece of information. It comes out in a finite amount of time. This whole argument will become clear when you look at NP completeness, where we'll say, does it come out in an exponential time or in polynomial time, or do we not know? Uh, that is both finite, but here it is infinity or finite, okay? So think of uh, this, these are arguments that make sense, provided your only time scale is finite or infinite. And in that sense, you can enumerate machines, all possible machines, such that every machine or a Turing machine or a program comes out after a finite amount of time and uh, all inputs for that program all, all has to be binarized so finally the world is zero uh, comprised of zeros and ones don't have ASCII syntax so every program has binary inputs and um, you can generate those run the program on that we're not doing any type checking nothing like that it is a type free world uh, Turing machines don't have a notion of type they are really meant to work on the tape alphabet star. So it's it's in that setting that we are doing all the argument. Moment you start introducing types and restrictions, things start becoming more and more decidable, and we are not going there. Okay. Good question. And here is a, a pseudocode that may also uh, tell you. This is another uh, way in which uh, the machine that purports or claims to be the acceptor for MW has the pseudocode. So what is this guy? I called it MATM. MATM is a Turing machine or as a program pseudocode. Its job is to take TM of M, okay, I'm introducing type so that you can read, string of W. And its job is to be an acceptor of all, acceptor of all MW pairs such that m accepts w, okay? Acceptor of all mw pairs is that m accepts w. How does it achieve that status? Uh, first call is check is a tmm, okay? This is just uh, to make sure that the syntax of a Turing machine is present. And then you can simply say run m on w. So you imagine a run method, you are given a, given a function pointer, you are given a string, you can dispatch that machine on that. And then you are trying to catch uh, the result in a status answer. Okay, but there's a comment here saying this may never come back. 
which is we know to be reality. But if it comes back, we are here. And then if start in the accept, go to accept, else go to reject. That's how the acceptance tester for MW looks like. Yeah. So this is all, this is all we are really saying. Yeah. So if you kind of are familiar with or following this kind of a presentation, most of the rest of the chapter is going to use sort of code and uh, show you the arguments. Yeah. Yeah. So how does this differ from the contract? Halting and acceptance are very close. So you can now change it to halt ATM. Okay. And then uh, when it if it stopped in the accept status or reject status. Yeah. If you just add another conditional there, then it'll be a halt acceptor. <laughs> Right. Yeah, which now has the ability to take all M and W pairs such that M halts on W. It's a one line change here. Yeah. Yeah. So they, uh, that's why I'm saying I'm going to show you the accept view. Uh, and then when you do the homework, you'll expand it to halt. Okay. 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 So now comes the big moment in the sense uh, how does this proof look? Uh, it's a proof by contradiction. So, so proof that ATM is not recursive. You know, we know that uh, it, it makes no sense to have a complete checker whether M accepts W or M doesn't accept W. So there's a third possibility always there, M loose. But this is saying, no, it is a recursive system, meaning there is always a way to say M accepts W or not, Boolean truth, no third option. That can be defeated. So suppose not, that is ATM is indeed recursive, then there exists a decider Turing machine for that language. So what does its C prototype look like? If somebody claims there's a decider, it'll look like a bool decider A, DMM input X. It's bool means I, I accept or M accepts W or M it doesn't accept W. It's a program tester, yeah. And nobody shows the library and all that. So the construction itself is um, like here, and uh, I'll put it, put this, and uh, you can study it. This is also in assignment six, exactly, as shown. This is the first step towards the proof. We'll do this proof in the next. The proof is uh, this question. Okay, so stepping through this, we are now building a new function, diagonal tm, which uh, first calls this uh, decider that is uh, <coughs> supposed to exist in a library, a recursive decider. It always comes back with a yes or no. So there is no comment needed saying loop, that's not needed. So you will be always here. And then you can check its decision. If not accepts, then what do we do? We go to our accept. So this not accepts is a statement about does Okay, sorry, say again, yeah? Yeah, but the, the, the diagonal of TM is a new machine we built, okay? No, you wasn't sure. It only takes one machine description. And it uh, takes that machine description as a machine, a runnable machine, and also the input to the machine. Yeah, people are allowed to do that. Does that say that the current machine accepts its own syntax? Its own syntax, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you heard about bootstrapping a compiler? So these things are done even in the real world. You can compile a compiler using, uh, you can compile the source code of a compiler using that compiler. You hate it? <laughs> there are programs that generate their own copy. Have you seen that? Oh yeah. Anyway, first one, okay, good, good question, good question. Yeah, what's your answer? Of how does the first compiler, chicken and egg, right? <laughs> how do they, yeah. Who compiled the first compiler? Anyone, anyone know? 
You should ask your compiler, professor. Yeah. You have to bootstrap it. You have to write it in minimal assembly. So if you have a, a decrement and a test equal to zero as in a single assembly instruction, you can write anything. So you kind of write the intended uh, C compiler using some assembly and then uh, get it to the source form. And, uh, you can bootstrap it from smaller scores till it finally builds it up to a grandiose C syntax compiler. Okay, And then you can feed that C syntax compiler to itself. Uh, this is an idea that is fun to get used to and uh, this is real real stuff and these are called coins. Uh, the programs that uh, print their own copy are called uh, coins and this is such a head hurty and mind bending topic. I have read it uh, about coins a lot and uh, not enough uh, I would say. Coin. coin or coin? Coin. Uh, like coin. No idea. Yeah. Coin, and, coin is a logician. Coin surname, uh, coin Markovsky algorithm, coin programs, uh, self-replicating programs. Uh. Second one, okay, coin computing. Coin is a program that, uh, which takes uh, no input and produces a copy of its own source. That's fun too. And you can write coins in many languages. And uh, there is an article that I read of somebody who took a challenge saying, I'm going to write a coin that prints its MD5 uh, compressed image of itself. And he won the challenge <laughs> and he has produced that code. Uh, I try to follow it. It actually uh, goes to a theory called recursion theor uh, theorem called recursion theorem. But uh, this is a coin in uh, Java and uh, it's a bit too long for my taste, but if you run it, it'll print a copy of itself. Yeah, and there's always some kind of a uh, syntactic construction hidden here that helps it self-replicate. Uh, this is another one. Some programming languages have the ability to eval. So eval s equal to print, eval s equal to ps. Okay, we can take one of these in C and uh, do it in a second where it's a C coin. We can, you can, you can do, uh, do this uh, in your spare time, but uh, they exist for all kinds of, any Turing complete language, uh, it exists. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I will not take time off. Uh, you should uh, have fun writing your own, or not writing, maybe at least trying your own coins. Yeah. Take one of these and uh, CC and run it. It will copy itself out. And this is kind of how uh, viruses also work, I'm told. Viruses can copy themselves, and uh, viruses are. In a sense, coins, I'm told. Uh, I haven't really deep studied it, but it all binds to recursion theorem, anything that can replicate themselves. But the idea we are not studying is self-replication, but uh, uh, self-ingestion. Uh, you eat yourself. Uh, but that is, a, that is seen uh, in uh, compiler literature as uh, bootstrapping and uh, other things like that. So back here, uh, decider uh, A M M is a call which is answering does M accept M because such a decider is assumed to exist and it has to then say whether M accepts M or not. And then not, we look at the neg negation, it doesn't accept. So M, so this uh, line is executed when this uh, condition passes, so this line gets executed when m doesn't, uh, I'll use it this notation, doesn't accept m. Downward arrow means uh, halt or, but downward arrow with an a means accept. Downward arrow with an a with a stroke means doesn't accept. Okay, that's my uh, hieroglyphics. So I have a little hieroglyphics here. Halts, accepts, uh, doesn't halt, doesn't accept. You can use that for a convenient uh, way of writing. So M doesn't accept M. That's when uh, diagonal goes to its own accept uh, label. So diagonal accepts, uh, diagonal accepts M. Diagonal accepts M. That's how Turing machines uh, are said to accept something. Turing machines, when given an input, accept. When they are found in their, stuck in their accept state. So diagonal of M accepts if M doesn't accept M. 
and diagonal of M doesn't accept, which is here, if M accepts M. So now all you need to ask is, does, uh, what is diagonal diagonal? Feed it to itself. Does it uh, go to its accept label or does it go to its reject label? Still in loop no, no, there's nothing loopy here. That's the thing. We, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see. Uh, so let us, uh, two things uh, asked here, uh, mentioned here. One is, uh, does this even have the possibility of looping built anywhere? Uh, no, we have assumed that this library function decider of A is perfect. It always comes back with yes or no. Never loop, uh, looping is not allowed. So the self-application is uh, all fine according to programming. So what we are asking is what happens if the code for diagonal, I'll call it D. Uh, yeah. So D is for D. So then you have to edit this into D and this into D. So this outcome now means, uh, so this positive outcome means uh, D doesn't accept D according to the wisdom of decider A. Okay, according to the wisdom of decider A, D doesn't accept. But according to the way D is written, D accepts. So D doesn't accept D when D accepts D. Fantastic, okay. So now let us go to the other case to see whether we avoid a contradiction. Contradictions are complete rolling out of a set of possibilities, okay? If there's a leaky path, then that leaky path is not full contradiction. Like in pumping lemma, you're, you're eliminating every possibility. So we go seeking some uh, recourse uh, in the other option saying, can you please help? So then we come here, and according to the wisdom of uh, D, uh, of uh, decider A, according to the wisdom of decider A, we are thrown here when D accepts D, but that's when D doesn't accept because D itself is rejecting its own code. So we get a full contradiction at that point. Yeah, so we have to now find who to, who to blame, okay? So whenever we are in contradiction, we see who, who should we blame. Who led us to this uh, contradiction? We go through the chain of uh, assumptions we made and refute one assumption which was kind of uh, hanging in the air and not coming from basic mathematics or unsubstantiated assumption. So this is like uh, assuming there is a DFA for this zero and one in language. So that assumption got uh, revoked when we found there is a pump that goes outside the language. So the only assumption that the computability theory um, introduced, I mean, of this argument introduced is that uh, decider A, a ex, uh, exists. Decider of A exists as a recursive full tester. That is the assumption under which this whole thing. So that doesn't exist. And if you assume that this decider of A, TM of M input X is a partial guy, meaning it is not completely endowed with a true false, it has its own ability to loop, uh, this contradiction goes away. It doesn't need to uh, be a contradiction anymore. Okay, I mean, I didn't invent it, but uh, this is wisdom passed down from ages and uh, people of that era. Uh, I don't know who wrote this uh, proof for the first time. I think I haven't read uh, Gödel and all that deep enough, but the proof by contradiction of occulting has been established around the Turing era uh, it would be fun history, literature, sur survey. Okay. I will just uh, have you think about this and uh, tell me whether uh, this uh, sits well with you. I mean, how else will we prove something that abstract? This is the only argument that seems to work. Um, people argue saying, who cares about halting problem? Uh, people in the real world, there are only two to uh, 200 uh, atoms, okay? So the world is finite state, the universe is finite state. So everything is finite state, everything is desirable, right? I mean, you can easily come into those arguments. Uh, we're kind of working in a, a level above. Okay. The fact that we have a pi and uh, transcendentals with infinite expansion gives us more liberties than what the universe allows us. <laughs> so we are working in the abstract space of infinities, yeah.
Okay, so let's do one more. I think that will be uh, time well spent because this construction usually doesn't go over well and I invented the pseudocode trick and I claim today it will go over well. Uh, this is uh, one more layer. Uh, using ATM as the anchor, it is now it is now able to show that other languages are also, many other languages are also not recursive or not decidable. And the way we are going to build a machine within machine view is as follows. So suppose somebody tells you that uh, there is a right TM tester with me. All it needs is, a, okay, so let me draw that situation in box view. That's where we are going. And this is exactly how NP-completeness reductions work. So this is why very nice segue. Okay, so what is a reg-tm uh, language? Reg-tm language is the language of all Turing machines, but many books and uh, starting with Sipser put an angle bracket kind of reminding us this is not a machine machine but the syntax of a machine uh, such that I, I don't really think that is necessary. Uh, in scheme, you would have written uh, uh, def or different or whatever with a back quote. That's the intent of the curly brace, back quote or quote, whatever you like. Quoted form of the syntax, a reminder of saying we are looking at syntax. M is a Turing machine whose language is regular. So the whole uh, computability theory tends to run into trouble when it starts asking deep questions about a simple syntax. So M is a Turing machine syntax. Uh, we just now <coughs> sort of saw that we can't ask a question about this syntax saying, does this Turing machine halt on all, all inputs or some input? That was the one. Now we are asking another kind of question. Does the Turing machine have a language that is encoding a regular language? And even if you claim that RegTM uh, is uh, recursive, we will get a contradiction. And the way the contradiction is going to work is uh, we'll show that we can build a decider for ATM. So this is what we'll try to show. If RegTM exists, uh, RegTM decider exists, we will be able to build a decider for ATM, which we showed in the earlier slide cannot exist, and hence this cannot exist. This is how the arguments chain off. How does it work in NP completeness land? Let me sh show you because these are all more comforting thoughts. We will take a problem called 3SAT, which is a Boolean problem, saying A plus B plus not C, Boolean formula. We'll show that we the first NP-complete problem, chicken and egg resolved. Then we will show that other problems like uh, answering cliques of a certain size are also NP-complete. Same process is being emulated in the computability world by first showing that ATM is uh, not recursive you buy into that argument and then a whole other bunch of other problems can be shown such as uh, uh, TMM has a, a regular language is also undecidable. That's how the connections go in this area. Okay. All right. So how do, how do you do that? Well, what we want to achieve is a construction such that uh, if you are given a decider of uh, reg tm, I'll write it this way. Somehow we are able to put it inside a box and then uh, establish uh, connections. These connections means we write extra code and all that. And the final answer, so we will put some code here, here, here. And final answer will be as if you built a ATM machine. So this is how the constructions will look. Giving a, given a new problem to show, this is a new problem, given a new problem, decided right here, given a new problem to show that it is impossible, we build up towards a 
already shown impossible problem. That's how the introduction works, okay? Build a already shown impossible problem using the questionable new problem. So if the questionable new problem is solvable, the already shown impossible problem is solvable. So the boxes within boxes view is like this. Uh, a lot of diagrams in this area, so that's why I'm setting the stage. The mapping reduction view is a more abstract notion which uh, I'll show a first taste of. But the mapping reduction view is a language to language mapping view, saying that uh, if you are given an instance here, MW, we will build a mapping process, some function that produces an instance of that language and then suppose a decider exists here then you get a decider for free here that's the arrows uh, mapping view and get used to these diagrams that's why i'm throwing these out uh, in multiple ways and in in the np completeness land this is how it happens the three sat and click will be placed side by side. So if you are given a program of the kind A plus B plus C and all that, we will build a graph here such that if this graph has a click of a certain size, then this problem is also equally hard. So if you have a polynomial time tester for clicks, you have a polynomial time tester for Boolean formulae. That's how that world works. Let me show you these uh, in pictorial form so you get used to the idea before you dive into the proof. Uh, the MP completeness uh, world will ground all this. And here's how that construction looks like. Uh, this is how we'll be ending uh, hopefully Thursday's lecture. Uh, one final diagram to take away kind of thing. So finally, uh, all said and done, uh, the uh, computability part is good, important. It will absorb that. But finally, as computer scientists, you will care maybe about NP completeness more. Then we will say, OK, if we give a formula like this, then we'll show you how to build a funny looking graph like that. And now if you can test for the existence of a four click in this sense, four click means it has to be a fully connected uh, set of four uh, something like that, all, all connections. So that's a four click. Four click means uh, it has to, all pairs are connected. And if you can pull out the four click from this graph in polynomial time, then you would have tested, equivalently tested, this formula being satisfiable in polynomial time. And like so for all NP complete problems. So if you solve one NP complete problem in polynomial, everything becomes polynomial. That's how this argument works. Uh, by connecting our problems, okay, but we are not there yet. So if, at least be prepared that the constructions will look weird. Uh, you are given a formula and you will build a graph that nobody even would build in real life maybe, but proving that there is a polynomial algorithm for this graph is a statement about the general solvability of cliques. Okay, so not there yet, but let's see how our argument works. So just to prepare you to that construction, let me draw a fresh uh, drawing saying that uh, somebody gave you a machine and an input. You somehow managed to translate it into a single new machine M prime in a nicely connected way. Okay, how that connection works will be defined later. But suppose you are, you are able to produce a new Turing machine code that incorporates MNW. Then what do we do? Then assume that uh, there is a, there exists a decider for M prime. That assumption will be revoked because after a few steps we will show then there exists a for MXFW or ATM. So that's how we will finish our proof, okay? So, yeah. 
So let's study how the translate works. And the translate uh, is giving it to an innocent tester, thinks that I can check the M prime having a regular language easily. That's what this decider claims. Then you can invert that and uh, claim this one. Okay, so this is a translator. And this is the first time I wrote it uh, after last semester. People just didn't get it, so I went back and wrote, and uh, it was too late for last year's class to really see it, but this time it's uh, hopefully easier. So this is my translator. I'll take a minute to look at it and uh, see if it agrees with you, C syntax-wise. So translator is taking a machine and a string and then printing out a machine, so printf. So a printf has two format statements hidden here. That's where you have to plug in something. What gets plugged in? MNW, yeah. So it just prints a new M prime code, M prime is looking like a machine, right? During machine. So it prints a new machine M prime code, incorporating M and W in the right place that makes sense. At least convince yourselves that it kind of looks like a Turing machine. M prime of X begins with a curly brace, so far good. The first is a if test. Uh, if X is of the form zero and one N, then go to accept W prime. Uh, in the Turing machine code coding land that is allowed. Then uh, comes a statement run percent s1 on percent s2, but by now it knows what it has to run on what. So it has incorporated run m1 w there based on what you gave. Then uh, this if is an uh, unfortunate if it has to hang in there when you run m prime, okay? You may never need to run M prime. That's the beauty of this whole construction. M prime is an object you create. Do you ever run it? You don't need to. Just give it to this uh, decider saying, please decide whether this is a regular language guy. It can do whatever it wants. It can call an oracle, it can telephone a friend, anything. <laughs> uh, you just give it to that guy. If that guy or that uh, machine says this M prime has a regular language, then you can invert the decision. So we, we just make a machine to fool some other machine which claims to exist. So that's the status of M prime. So M prime so far looks like a machine. And so if this execution results, but the M prime code is uh, nicely laid out, uh, then M prime goes to accept M prime if, uh, okay, so this is uh, how we built M prime. How does this even take us to the next step? That is the, interesting thing and uh, I know that it'll go with 30% success maybe if I'm lucky today but uh, we'll <laughs> try it maybe. Okay so translate yields a description of a Turing machine and that's what the print produces. Now suppose full decider TM reg TM exists that's the mystery guy whose existence is going to allow full decider for ATM to exist. Okay, so now how, how you build full decider ATM is like this. C program or whatever, Turing machine program, full decider ATM, it takes uh, M and W because decider for ATMs have to take a machine and a word. And then it just returns full decider reg TM applied to translate of MW. We will we'll clarify it in a second. So piece by piece, translate of MW produces this funny looking machine M prime, which we didn't understand, but we'll get to it in a second, okay? And then it simply passes that M prime to full decider rectum. So the claim now is that if you make an M prime like this in the previous slide and give it to full decider rectum, its decision now return is equivalent to, is perfectly uh, good as a decider, uh, as a full decider ATM, okay? So the same return value goes out. So if I am saying that this M prime has a regular language, this M accepts W, that's the conclusion we are able to draw in a second. 
if this m prime doesn't have a regular language m doesn't accept w that's how the thing will connect up okay let me uh, let me just look at uh, this code and uh, wonder when this guy has a regular language that's the key piece and then we'll for, uh, do other things so we know that we called translate with m and w formal parameters but yeah translate m and w as called so let's expand it out so look just focus our eye on this part that's the program m prime and we splice in m and w So that's the translate's result. The translate produced a new single machine M prime, which has only a single argument. And then it has spliced to the other machine. Now we can ask, when is this guy's language regular? That's all we need to ask. If this guy's language can be tested to be regular, then it is leaking some info about M status on W, how? Okay, so what's a language? Language is a set of all strings that uh, some machine likes. You pump in all kinds of strings, and if the machine goes into accept state, it likes it, checkbox, okay? More strings, checkbox, anything that hits the accept label. So let's draw schematically all the strings that you send in, and the machine likes it. So let me use green arrows. You throw in one string into M prime, boom, it goes. And if it is of the form zero and one N, land there, okay? You see that? That's one string. That's not language, that's one string. Throw more strings at it. Again, if it is of the form 0 and 1 n, for like 0, 25, 125, it'll hit there. In the language. Checkbox, okay? Keep checking. Checkbox, checkbox. Where else is an accept label hidden in this uh, code? Yeah, 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 around there. Okay, so there's another possibility to hit accept. <coughs> so now we have to throw another string. Uh, let me uh, draw it in this color, dark. So through another string, it's not of the form 0 and 1 n, so it has to go here. Then there's a conditional run m accepts on uh, m on w that may loop, it may never come back. In which case, if it's an infinite loop, that string goes nowhere. But if that run comes back, then we can test whether that m run on w stuck, got stuck in its accept state. Then this green string will also come and stick here. You see that? So this is a little trap door we build in. There's a floor that uh, opens up for more strings. When does that floor open? When m accepts w. That floor is closed when m doesn't accept w. So based on whether the floor is open or not, the language of M prime changes. So let's say that the floor is shut, never opens. Then what are all the strings that go and stick on accept? These guys, zero and one n. Because there's an upstairs before the trap door. So if M doesn't accept W, all the strings that go and stick on an accept label Go stick here. That's the fly paper. It goes sticks sticks there. That's the fly paper. Those are all the strings. So then the language will be zero and one n, right? Because it's of the form zero and one n. Is that regular or context free? We know that. Context free. So at that point, so if m doesn't accept w, the language of m prime is context free. But if m accepts w, the floor opens. All the other strings pour here but m accepts w, so they all go here. Then the language is sigma star. So the language of m prime is uh, either a context-free language or a sigma star language, which is regular, based on whether m accepts w. That floor opens, no, puzzle, puzzle looks. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, go through it again. Um, 
Uh, definitely don't pretend you understand this. I did it for 25 times and then 26 times. So yeah, so here's the trapdoor and I'll draw it again. So there is a, imagine there is a little trapdoor and uh, I'll take a specific question. Who are like hands? Okay, yeah. Um, is X different from W? Yeah, yeah, yeah. M X is just the argument. So this is a machine, right? This M prime of X has its own argument. You have to imagine M prime of X as a situation like M prime wants to run on X. So whatever you put on M prime's tape is all the X's it sees. That's how that worldview is. Yeah, so M prime is reacting with respect to whatever X you present itself. Yeah, they're completely different. Yeah. And then uh, the M prime's code's behavior is uh, like, uh, like I showed whenever you send a string uh, like on, the, on its own tape, then all, all the cases where it's of the form 0 and 1n, M prime likes those and it includes it in M prime's language. But additional strings are included if uh, conditional on whether M accepts W. And that, that goes here. So that additional string acceptance is uh, conditioned on whether M accepts W. That's all, yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah. Okay, well, in your assignment six, so you had to, again, try to shift it to context free. It's not a very hard shift. Uh, maybe it's even in the book, but understand this construction and try to make sure that the context free tester also is impossible. Um, the grand theorem in this area is called Rice's theorem, which is the, saying that you're given a syntax for a Turing machine, Asking any non-trivial question about that Turing machine's language is undecidable. That's a grand theorem. You can only ask two questions uh, and be decidable. Is this Turing machine's language empty or uh, is this uh, Turing machine's language? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, if, if the partition process, the predicate that you ask has to be um, based on the language uh, you cannot classify. <laughs> Yeah, uh, unless it's a trivial property. Any non-trivial property of the language. Um, so you're trying to erect up, okay, this is what it is. Uh, it's not exactly what I said. You're trying to partition the space of all Turing machines into Turing machines that have regular language and Turing machines that don't have a regular language. That is a partitioning process attempted on the space of codes out there, Turing machines out there. You cannot have a decider that decides that partition ever, meaning if you are randomly thrown, we can't say you are here or here. The only case that works is such a useless case saying, are you a Turing machine or are you not a Turing machine? So the partition has to be a non-trivial partition <laughs> in one extreme or the other. But that's a useless property. Nobody wants to know uh, that partition question. So Rice's theorem says any test, any test uh, of a program based on the syntax of that program that goes somewhat deep cannot be decided by another Turing machine. In this case, it's a context-free property or regular property or does this Turing machine stop in 10, 10 seconds or does it write the 50th cell or does this program reach this label or does this program accept everything? All these are non-trivial properties. So no non-trivial test of a program is possible. This is the real Rice's theorem. Yeah. Uh, I will lead, uh, uh, leave you with some basics for the next uh, material because uh, you need to cool off a little bit. And for the next one, binary decision diagrams are going to come in a really nice, fun way through two tools, and I'm going to show you that. The first is a tool called the binary decision diagrams. And uh, binary decision diagrams are fun to know because uh, that tells you in one second how Boolean logic can be enjoyed. Uh, I, I show this, uh, when I teach 2100, I teach binary decision diagrams and uh, it comes out fun. So first Joe tutorial, let me see whether it works. Um, chapter 18. We find out. Oh, 18 is lambda calculus. So if you want to study lambda calculus uh, based during uh, computability, that is chapter 18. Chapter 17 is uh, 
we need this uh, for your uh, assignment yeah binary decision diagrams are dfas trying to implement boolean functions and often dfas can represent boolean functions compactly a lot of boolean function representations are truth table based okay truth tables we all no truth tables, but how big are they? How big is a truth table of variable x0 dot 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 x63? You are asked to build a truth table for 64 variables. How many rows? 2 raised to 64 rows. I'll be dead before I start. <laughs> Finished, rather. <laughs> Not short. Okay. Truth tables are horrible. Truth tables are guaranteed exponential. And computer aided in the design and microprocessor industry cannot deal with exponential and they use uh, compact representations for boolean functions that's how they uh, that's how your computers work they are all formally verified up to a certain level and the formal verification technology in the boolean space uses things like binary decision diagrams so what are they they are minimal dfa in disguise very few people know that uh, many people know that, but uh, not many, many smart people don't know that. Even the person who introduced uh, binary decision diagrams wrote his first paper with a proof that was horribly long, and somebody told him later, you reinvented minimal DFAs uh, being canonical. Uh, but that is not his only contribution. He did a lot of other good work, but that theorem was completely missed. Uh, recently, a distinguished uh, lecturer came, I won't name him, he came to my office, I told him binary decision diagrams are minimal DFA. He said, is that so? Uh, but it's well known in many circles. So this is, uh, this is kind of well known to you. If you build an XOR gate, what, what, is it, what are its truth combinations? XOR is 0, 1 or 1, 0, correct? So you can build a language out of it. XOR language is 0, 1 or 1, 0. That's it, finite language. Then what do you do? Or it NFA, NFA, DFA, min DFA, dot object DFA, you get a decoder for XOR. And that is, uh, that actually works like a nice Boolean calculator also. So the general idea of a binary decision diagram is to take the truth table combinations of a, and this is what it looks for another language. This is a truth table combination for uh, some greater okay this is the comparator so if you are build, uh, building a magnitude comparator x2 x1 x0 is it less than y2 y1 y0 you write all the boolean combinations of when one is below the other and then you can get a that's the decoder for comparison it's not exponent it, it is exponential the problem here is that we did not feed this DFA bits in the right order. You fed uh, this x2 bit, then this y2 bit, then this x1 bit, then this y1 bit. That's a horrible way of feeding it because you don't, you can't decide. No, no, no. What you fed is you fed this x2, then this x1, then this x0. Can you make a decision? No, you have to wait for y2. The better feeding order is feed this, feed this, feed that. So binary decision diagrams are a way to build this minimal DFA, but uh, with the right feeding order. So if you feed it in the right order, it becomes small. And binary decision diagrams are a different looking data structure. And it's available on a website. It's built by a former student of mine, and this gets used uh, by many universities. So whenever my machine goes down, we get an email saying, your BDD package went down, please, I'm using it for my class. <laughs> and it's enter your formula here, and it's powered by a little machine under my desk. Variable order x2, x1, x2, x3, um, et cetera, et cetera. Main expression is, are these two equivalent? So you can then say build BDD. That's a binary decision diagram. It looks like a DFA, but it has uh, jumped uh, many steps when it doesn't need to decode through useless combinations, it takes a direct jump. So it says, what is the formula here? Not x1 and x2 and x3 or x4. If x1 is true, we know its value is 
not x1 is false and then the rest doesn't matter okay so when x1 is true it jumps to false i use a red for uh, zero because zero is the most important number and that's utah one is byu <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember red and blue here. Okay. Well, zero is the most uh, interesting number. Okay. So this is like a decoder. It doesn't meander through. I don't care about x2. I don't care about x3. So we'll learn about uh, binary decision diagrams. You already seen how binary decision diagrams are a nice way to represent uh, Boolean formulae. And uh, we'll play with that next time. But wait a minute. We are not done. We are going to study satisfiability. Uh, and satisfiability is available in your fingertips. Um, I'll tell you how. Go to my book and uh, go to which page? Go to page 265. If you go to page 265, cr click on Crypto Mini Sat, and then you get a Sat solver in your web browser. This is a Boolean satisfiability solver that runs uh, JavaScript in your browser. And this is the way we are going to study NP completeness. So, this is my encoding for a Boolean formula in a standard format, and it encodes v1 or v2. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, yeah, it is encoding. Two variables are used, uh, two variables both being true. So x1 or x2 and x1 or not x2 and not x1 or x2 and not x1 or not x2. Is that formula satisfiable? We'll find out. Click on this play button. It says unsat, unsatisfiable. But now if I remove this line, is that Boolean formula satisfiable? It is, and it will tell you how it is satisfiable. So this is a Boolean satisfiability tester in your browser. It is supposed to be NP complete and supposed to take forever. But this SAT solver can solve uh, easily 1,000 variable formulae because SAT solvers in practice are not really, NP, uh, uh, not really exponential. In practice, people have found very good heuristics. But understanding how SAT solvers work is Cool because SAT solvers drive a lot of technology out there. This is SAT solving is the way a lot of programs are verified and uh, a lot of equivalence testing, real industrial tool. So you will get to play with Boolean satisfiability and BDDs, and then we'll understand NP completeness, uh, test uh, the constructions. Okay. So next time, yeah.